please, very, very big welcome to Yard's Meryl Garbus. Thank you. So I believe you've been locked away for the last 10 days or so. Is that working on a new record? Mm-hmm. Locked. Yep. Uh, what kind of, what sort of phase are you in? Are you in a collecting phase or a writing phase or a recording phase? Uh, we, we do it all right now at the same time. Um, we started spending money on, on equipment of our own so that we didn't have to be in a recording studio all the time and pay for that time. Um, I am, I get really nervous about money and always have. In fact, this is really incredible to be here because <clears throat> I used to live here and I had no money. <laughs> Um, when I lived here, and um, and it's really weird to be here and have money, and have money, uh, <laughs> like literally to go to the, the depaner and buy like groceries instead of like a grocery. <laughs> um, but that is all to say that uh, I, I find something that's hard about being in a recording studio is that I know what I need to get done there usually, or I know that I need to get a lot done, and I'm watching the minutes tick down, and um, I find that that's not uh, conducive to creativity. So um, Nate, my partner, and I, we uh, we started investing in, you know, we got an Apollo converter, we got, um, we have a UA preamp, we have uh, we have our little rack, and we brought that rack to a to a cottage by the ocean in California, and um, <laughs> and that's where I find my inspiration by the sea. Um, it felt really luxurious, but that's what what we did. I got to you know I would wake up in the morning and do what is now my practice of qigong meditation and I got to do that outside I live in Oakland California so usually there's there are many floors and much concrete beneath me but it was like grass underneath my feet and um and you know take audio samples of the ocean and realize a lot about white noise and we had a um a prophet six synthesizer with us so it would be like just looking out at the ocean, making oceanic type white noise as we were listening to also to, it was just crazy. So that's what we did. And also we composed songs and wrote lyrics and, um, and all of those things. But I'm finding that a lot of it is, it feels better to me if it's not like, okay, I'm about to make an album. I'm going to start by, uh, finding, finding things and then whittle them down into songs. And then the songs be, get mixed down and then become a record. If I'm just making music all the time and, and you know, hearing Pauline Oliveros just now is so inspiring, um, listening, just listening and listening and listening and listening to what I'm producing and then listening around and listening, you know, just these, um, just endlessly listening and and creating in a way that feels uh, not not hurried and um, and hopefully sustainable, you know? I mean, it seems like over your records, some instruments have kind of come in and out of your sound. You know, at the beginning, it was just you, loop pedal and a ukulele. And then you kind of added bass guitar and various other things. Are there certain instruments that are kind of back in the mix or out of the mix in the music you're making at the moment? Yeah. Yeah, the, the ukulele got old, I guess, in a way, or it got confining. <laughs> but the first Tune Yards record was... Um, it wasn't looping pedal, it was Audacity, that free freeware. It was like pre-garage band. Uh, Cause I'm old. Um, but it was it was looping that way. So it was looping in, in a real, like almost word document cut and paste way. Um, and and it was interesting then using looping pedals as a way to to create music write music, but then also to recreate what I was recording that way live. Um, so, but yeah, I don't, I think, I think for a long time, I mean, my voice is absolutely my primary instrument. And for a long time, I felt pretty, um, I won't say embarrassed, but that that wasn't a legitimate instrument uh, to, you know, compared with, I don't know, studying 
drums or any other or or guitar or piano or any you know having I didn't feel like I had a fluency or I had uh, an ability to be a legitimate musician based on the fact that I had been singing my whole life but that's kind of what comes through so ukulele was a way I think that was my first um one of the first instruments that really drew songs out of me that really felt like the songs could come through but I think it was less about the ukulele and more about um more about a framework for for songs if that makes sense you just mentioned kind of you know starting out in Montreal and living in a tiny apartment and recording bird brains um and I just wondered what kind of support you had from the kind of people around here. You've talked about the scene being very supportive and that being the only reason that Tune Yards came into existence. Can you give us a bit of a sense about what that was and what you had to do to make that happen? Um, friends, friend, some of whom, one of whom especially is in the audience now, uh, Patrick Gregoire, who's a big part of this this town from what I, I mean, the hugest part of my town <laughs> of Montreal. Um, but Patrick and I started playing music when, um, when we met uh, teaching at a summer camp and, and uh, I started coming up to Montreal. We were playing gigs together and then I was introduced to this whole world of, of uh, people just playing music and, and, and doing that. <laughs> As a as a thing, I came from a background of puppeteering, um, <clears throat> very different from the bohemian scene of indie rockers that I found here in Montreal. Uh, but no, I like that that people were putting on their own shows and were um, were living were living in an urban environment that was also hospitable to creativity. You know that to me. I was living in Vermont in a very isolated and um, insular community. And to be in a city and be and have all, I mean, the city, Montreal is, um, there's something about it that's still really uh, alive to me and really um, moving to me as a city. And I think that was very clear. Um, and then I guess the support, you know, you you're here collaborating with each other. I was saying to Emma before that I, when you say the word collaboration to me, I instantaneously go like, <gasps> because my, because I love being by myself and creating music personally. I mean, there's something about that that is, it's the reason why I started or continued to play music was being alone with music and listening to records at my parents' house with these huge 70s style headphones as a kid and losing myself in music. And, um, and I find that I have a, I have a tendency to just want that. I want the numbing quality almost of music and losing myself. And, um, I think, I think in Montreal, first of all, people are supportive of, of, um, or were when I was here supportive of innovation that people were doing weird shit. Can I swear? Um, and, and applauding each other for it, and um, and and there was also this history of you know Arcade Fire and Wolf Parade and these bands that um, you know the the ambitious person in me of which she is a huge she's huge in there I didn't it's, you don't see that huge, ambitious huge person but she's in there and that part of me and I think that part of us when we had a band was like we can do this we can make money on you know playing music we can um we can make a living we can tour the world we can um it was like this it was a dream you know it's dreamy I mean come on we're all sitting here there was like a glorious buffet of the best food on earth in there I got a cappuccino for free you know um this is living the friggin' dream and um and I think that that um but but also living in a way that doesn't seem, um, it's, it seemed um, organic and sustainable. I didn't need a lot to be, I was so happy here and I didn't, and I lived in a utility closet with a boiler, you know. What do you have to give 
in a, a, an environment like that. You know, some of you might have been lucky enough to have experienced that either as a music fan or as, a, as an artist, where you're part of something that's happening and, and you're there as it's happening, as it's developing. And I, I would say in those things, you, you kind of gain your status by doing, by contributing. Did you have that experience of a moment where you felt like, oh, I can see this thing happening, it's something I can do and wanting to contribute from that point or just suddenly feeling that you had this stuff you were doing on the side that suddenly could fit in to something that was occurring? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think I, I felt that something, um, I felt that something happened with Toon Yards that specifically hit a cultural nerve, I guess, and it hit a nerve at a specific moment in, in music and music, I don't know, where, wherever we're at or wherever we were at 10 years ago, because now Tune Yards has existed for a decade, which is insane, and and also makes me feel terrified a lot of the time. Because I think that that can happen to, to musicians where you hit a nerve and then you're like, and then everyone's all up your in your stuff for a hot second. And then, um, and the idea, because I think we're all ravenous for new music and new ideas, there's a sense that like, oh, and then what happens? Or, or <clears throat> you know, the, the kind of, I don't know. I felt like absolutely I hit a nerve. And then from then on, what do you do with that? Everyone expects, you know, and, and I expect of myself better, just like the same, so that people don't, you don't lose your audience and, um, and bigger, like something more to, you know, instead of what I'm finding now is that I get to have my musical practice and that cultural nerve, it can be there and I can hit it or not. But if I don't have my practice, then I'm kind of floating in this wind of <clears throat> other people's perception of me or other people's, um, desires of me versus, um, versus centering myself, uh, in, in my artist practice, which is totally new for me as a concept. So I'm interested in this idea of like, particularly if you're kind of the sort of artist who has a very singular practice, how do you manage when more people get involved? You know, you started as one, you became two, suddenly there's kind of a whole load of people involved in tune yards. Um, how do you manage that? <clears throat> I don't. Because uh, then I hired a manager. That was a really good thing <laughs> because I don't manage things well. But more, less on a practical level and more on a creative level. You know, yeah. suddenly there's different inputs. It's not just you in a room doing what you want. There are other people with ideas or suggestions or input, musical mm -hmm. or, or other types of input. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, think, um, I think right now i mean the first the first thing is that even though I, I say i love making music by myself it's very it was always very clear to me from a very early point that making music with other people is far more rewarding and that was you know singing singing with other people you know i, I sang in choirs and a cappella groups from all of my youth and and that was where i had those moments of of next level musical experience so um so I think as much as I hate, you know, in the way that I, um, I'm a, I'm pretty afraid when it comes down to it, and I'm pretty afraid of other humans because other, let's be real, we're pretty crazy. We all have our own shit. And so meeting somebody else, you're instantaneously being exposed to their stuff. And especially in a musical context, when we are at our most open, I believe, um, if we're doing it well, or we're doing it honestly, um, that's a scary place to be, but I also believe in it so much that I'm willing to do that. And um, so now my primary collaborator is my husband, which is nice because we get along pretty well. Uh, and we we have formed a um, a real trust with each other and a real back and forth, so that I feel like I'm putting out stuff and I'm I can safe. It feels safe to engage in this collaboration. Um, and then we broaden it out from there. And so what has happened is that as Tune Yards has gone through these different you know, albums and cycles, we'll start with the core of the two of us and then grow that out to, you know, we took two saxophone players on the road or we took, last time we took um, two vocalists and a percussionist on the road. And that um, when I, I guess I know that I'm, 
I have trouble answering questions. I hope I'm answering the question. But to answer the question, I think having the central um, core of what what I know to be the honest part of the music, if that's there and I can keep that intact, um, I can sense really clearly when that's not there, when that no, that person's not working or I need to talk to them about uh, groove or I need to talk to them about, um, you know, I know that you're feeling this, I know that you're feeling this on top of the beat, but like I really need you to sit back into it. I I'm I've grown my confidence over this over these years to be able to um, to really sense when it's not working and and have the confidence and the the wherewithal to communicate that. See, another thing you've been doing around collaboration is bringing together other female artists for the Claw Radio Show that you've been doing for RBMA Radio. Um, how have you found kind of instigating other people's collaborations as opposed to your own? Mm. It's tough. Has it been, I mean, it's tough. It's really, but uh, it's tough from like a logistical point of view. And I don't see, I don't see the collaborators. I think they're really excited. And in fact, I mean, the whole, the whole premise was that I wanted to pair uh, women rappers with women beat makers because a lot of the women rappers that I was, hearing um and discovering um they weren't they when I asked them have you collaborated with women beat makers they were kind of like oh no not yet but that would be cool and um and kind of vice versa and um that would like it's been so thrilling so I say it's difficult because it's like trying to co excuse me, coordinate women around the world and being like, hey, I hear that you, like, I love your music and I think that this woman is doing stuff that you might, uh, that um, that kind of logistics part of it, um, which Julian has been incredible in helping me with that. But um, but but it's been tough to, to corral people, again, because I think we're all into our own thing. I'm doing my thing right now. And to kind of feel... Um, feel the value of spending time in that kind of collaboration. Um, it's been, it's been tough for me to ask actually, cause I understand what that means for other musicians, but the, the collaborators have been so eager and I think there's been so much, um, I mean, really every track that comes through feels really well done and really brilliant to me. So this is part of the radio show you're doing monthly. It'd be good to talk a bit about that and, and what you're doing with it, but with the collaborations, who's collaborated with who and just maybe give us a sense about who you're asking to work with each other. Uh -huh. um, well, I think the one one that will play is Susie Analog, who's a rapper from the Bay Area, um, with uh, Susie Analog. Wait, Queen's Delight, sorry. Susie Analog's from New York. Queen's Delight, a rapper from the Bay Area. Susie Analog, a producer uh, in New York. And, um, and Susie Analog was someone that I there were a few producers that really stuck out when I first started listening. And this is also CLAW became, CLAW stands for Collaborative Legions of Artful Women. And, um, and that it kind of, it was just this concept that I wanted to work on, um, to familiarize myself with women producers because a lot of times we're asked or are interested in working with other producers. And it was very rare that there would be any woman's name on that list of producers. And I wanted to know why. And uh, and sure enough, it's not because there aren't women producers, as we know. Um, so there were a lot of people that, that you all at RBMA introduced me to um, that I'm sorry, I lost the question. Who else are there? So, so the people who you've the people so, who've so you've discovered through the radio like show. Latasha Alcindor, LA, um, is a rapper out of New York, and she was one of the first that I I started listening to her stuff and being like, oh, how did I not know this that this woman existed? Um, she collaborated with Asma Maruf, uh, DJ Ma from Nguzu Nguzu, and that was the first collaboration. And Asma and I met uh, speaking at on a panel about women producers and um, and I think her work and and um, the future brown work and the Nguzu Nguzu work is so creative and I was I learned so much from her about um, DJing really I just started to DJ and and what she was doing as a DJ was really fascinating to me so those were the two the first two um, and um, 
And from there, it was just a whole lot of names. We have a whole spreadsheet of, of a bazillion uh, producers and, and rappers now. So it's important on the shows that you're celebrating women from across time and space. I mean, there are shows where you're playing music by, um, you know, people extremely influential women from the past, like Daphne Aram and, and then Kalela Records. Mm -hmm. You wanted to kind of dig deep in both directions. Yeah, I mean, mostly because I I know so little, and there was so much uh, there's so much that I wanted to know, and and I mean, I think the the difficult part is that how do you how do you frame it, you know? So so I did. I think we've done two women raps ep episodes. One was more um, MC Light, and you know, like like uh, um, I don't think we played Queen Latifah, but you know, like the women rappers that that I kind of grew up with and know, and then um, and then I wanted. Uh, you know, one that was a bit more contemporary. Um, so those, so the episodes are, you know, something I was also experimenting with was how to be a DJ. And so I was trying to mix and, um, and do the edits live, which is far more time consuming than just having a playlist of songs. However, I've learned a lot about it and, um, and learned a lot from, from mixing and from, um, there's so much to talk about, Emma. But well, you know, before we kind of veer off into a whole other area, should we yeah. just like wheel back a tiny bit and have a look at the the, yes. the video that was made for the collaboration? Please. This is the analog. Let's have a look at that, please. The, the tagline of the show is that it's music by women and women identifying producers. Why was it important to open it up like that? Uh, just because it's all about inclusion and people, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think a lot of times I remember posting something, um, it was just a quote from, from, I think one of the Raincoats members and it was like, this music could only be made by a woman. And I, and there was a lot of, um, a lot of feedback that I got, not a lot, but there was a whole discussion that came up on the f Facebook feed that was like, why does it all always have to be, you know, male versus female? And I thought, no, <laughs> it's not, um, it's, it's who's not being heard. And so that's what, um, uh, we need to just be hearing people who, who are not heard, whose people, whose voices we don't tend to hear. And, um, and, and it was never, it's never about being exclusionary. It's about being inclusive and and um, like Pauline was talking about, listening, listening, and then listening with wider ears and bigger ears and and listening some more. So, um, I think there's a strong, a strong uh, community of musicians that that come together in different. How do I be articulate about this? You know, for instance, queer DJ collectives, I think, are making some of the most innovative music that I'm hearing right now. And and I what I think is that there are these spaces for for people to feel safe in who they are and wh how they identify. Um, and and I just you know, I think from from now on, that's what needs to happen. <laughs> we just need to be more inclusive. Who would you be? Who would you be speaking about there when you talk about um, queer DJ collectives that you're really rating? Um, I don't know how you say Q N K U N Q. How does I don't know how they say that, but that's um, there's it's a DJ collective that um, their uh, Fox Work is the DJ that I've been particularly. Um, uh, she was one of the collaborators and she um, just, she was really, I'm just learning a lot. I think through the whole claw thing, I, I just wanted to absorb information and wisdom from people and, and really hearing like, well, what do you, you know, what do you need? How do you need to be heard? And who are, who are you hearing that the world isn't hearing? I mean, those women um, are, it's incredible to see that video to me. Um, partially because it's so cool to see my neighborhood in Oakland, California, and then also to know that the women in Brooklyn were, um, you know, had their community being part of the video. And um, and to hear Queen's Delight say, your power, your high power, and speaking to, to women, um, 
it makes me so happy just just to facilitate that. You know, I had no part. I didn't do any of that work. I just did the work of putting those women together and um, filtering the funding from RBMA Radio to them so that they could create that together. And um, and other than that, uh, so I'll just say I wanted to listen and kind of understand. Um, for instance, Fox work was like, hey, I have all these these female identifying artists, women who who I'm working with, who I'm connected with. And I was like, really? Because <laughs> that's what I'm really interested in right now. So it's all these this information being shared. And what I also wanted to do with with Claw is collabor collaboration, collaborative legions of artful women, artful because I think there's at first it was artistic women, and I was like, oh, that sounds really lame. But art, artful is like, you know, uh, a little tricky, like like having to navigate. Um, and I think that's that uh, felt like a, a good aspect to add to the whole thing, that we are, but also we're finding this collaboration instead of um, pitting each other against, one another against each other, that we're all sharing with each other information. And I hope that that's what's happening here, and I can assume that it is, that there's, you know, there's a healthy competition where you kind of go like, oh, oh, you think that beat is, is really dope? Well, let me show you what I, you know, <laughs> like, there has to be that thing where we egg each other on for sure, but all in the spirit of of coming together and and um and having this having these relationships with each other, I think that's really the love part of it and the open heart part of it um, is something that I definitely wanted. And therefore, it's not like, oh, here are my you know here are my women producers that I am discovering and showing to the world. It's not about that. It's about um, how do we connect with each other. So it's you know it's really great to hear about the kind of platforming you're doing for other people and like the stuff that you're really enthusiastic about. But I'd like to bring it back to you for a minute, if I may, and to talk about your voice, and to talk about how you get such a lot of dynamic range and tonal range in a voice from very very big and quite angry to extremely soft, and how hard you have to work to get a voice to do that kind of thing. So hard. Um, well, I'm only. I mean, I kind of say that. Uh, jokingly, but it has been kind of hard lately, uh, in that I don't think it's, you know, one thing that's not hard is kind of opening my mouth and, and making noise. That has felt pretty intuitive for, um, for a lot of my life. But, um, but I started to have vocal troubles because, you know, we played, we started to play, we used to play opening sets, right? So that would be 35 minutes and I would just like wail for 35 minutes and that would be fine. And then we started headlining shows and then we had about, you know, say 55 minutes of music and I could do that. And then this last tour, it was more like, you know, you're headlining, headlining in a show and people are paying money to see you. And so it's like an hour and 15 minutes or 90 minutes or whatever. And, um, and show after show after show. And my voice just didn't want to do that. And my voice, um, I had been told for a long time that there was a, a way, I had been told in not so nice ways that I was using my voice wrong. <laughs> um, and as a singer, especially as a singer who's actively singing as a you know career, um, that's a terrifying thing to be, to be told that you're doing this wrong and that you might not have a voice left when you are however old. And um, I went to a vocal doctor and they put the camera down and I didn't have... I didn't have anything wrong other than a little swelling, but I did take speech therapy lessons. And again, all of this is like, cause I could finally pay for it, right? This is all, it's all a progress, um, a progression that is of, um, of being willing to understand my voice better. So now I take uh, classical voice lessons, which is something um, that I wanted to talk about because I think that um, for a long time, I just wanted to, to use my voice the way that I, I heard it. Um, and the way that I felt it and not abide by a technique and certainly not classical technique, which I felt like was going to turn my voice into something that it was not. Um, I, I tend to use way more, you know, chest and belty a vocal um, technique rather than all that range. Uh, but I was willing to do it. And now, um, so now it is this really, this really hard work, hard for me because when people ask me to sing, I think what they're, they're asking me is like, go, you know, give it to us, you know, give it, give it all. And they want to hear this loud, powerful 
voice. And my teacher started me on like, like that voice. So it's like shrinking my voice down to the pinhole of it, you know? And, um, and so that's been really hard to trust that process. And, and I'm, I feel grateful to have the patience now to know how to practice actually, which I I haven't for most of my life. (laughs) Can you just tell us what is wrong? You know, what is wrong singing if you're using your voice? I mean, obviously there's lots to be said about doing things wrong. It's Mm -hmm. often the best way to do things. Um, but what are the things that damage your voice if you're using it a lot every night? Right. I mean, I, I, yeah, I hesitate to use the word wrong. I, I think that there are so many things in speech, uh, particularly that, um, that get in the way of the voice naturally being produced. So, what I'm learning, and I know but a little, uh, what I'm learning is that it's most, for me, it was a lot of the larynx coming up and this, uh, like a, a grabbing in order to to push up from the bottom to create, um, to, to move up a scale, say, um, versus really the way that I am now finding resonance is just that, is finding residen- resonance, that there is this whole cavity of space sinuses there's a whole there's a lot of I don't know it's very mystical actually that sound sound isn't what I thought I thought sound was like okay you push air up here this way and you push it out and the sound is me pushing my pushing air through my vocal cords and pushing it out to you but really that's not how we are hearing anyway and so I'm trying to wrap my brain around around I think what I you know a, a more um, sustainable way to create, to, to sing, is to get out of the way of the voice, to just get out of the way. So that's all, all of my jaw tension and the tension in my neck and the back of the neck and, um, and then also all the tension in your body. I'm going to stand up. Is that okay? Like, like lately I sing like this where... She's my teacher is like, okay, you have to just like circle your hips. And it's if you try, everyone should stand up right now. I'm serious. Try it. (laughs) So if you're just standing and you're and just breathe and like put your hand on your belly button and make sure that when you inhale, that you breathe into your hand and your stomach's expanding. And then when you exhale, your stomach goes in towards your rib, towards your spine. And then if you just gently, like like as if your hips are going around a clock face. And and if you're really, you can pretty much zone out on it, but it's like all these little muscles get released around your hips and the sense that your diaphragm has this room to expand and then contract and you're not resisting in any part of it and then you can go the other direction it's relaxing right (laughs) yeah okay you can sit now (laughs) so that's the kind of stuff that I'm doing that feels like slow it feels so slow you know and really like this fine like do you ever I don't know how many of you are sitting at computers making music most of the time yeah and that and uh, that's, I think, really hard because we're, I mean, you, you have this, you have the headphones or you have speakers, you have a certain sense, but to have, to have a sense of internalizing rhythm, especially of how people are going to dance to your music, of how people are going to absorb your music in their, in their bodies. Um, yeah, I think we need a new working, works, we need new innovative workstations, you know, where you're kind of at the very least standing, which I know that they have, but like that you're, you're just more ready somehow physically. It would be nice to hear something, including your voice. Although now it feels like it feels like you're, well, maybe you should just play a little bit of real thing, even if it's from a a vocal period, which is now. (laughs) Oh yeah. Slightly wrong. Slightly in the past. It was wrong. Let's, let's hear you (laughs) singing a little bit wrong. Just a little taster. So we're remembering who we're listening to. (laughs) 
You've talked in the past about wanting to free your voice from Western traditions. What, what does that mean to you? <clears throat> it means the opposite of what I'm doing now, taking Western classical voice lessons. <laughs> Uh, no, I think it's just that the, I mean, as with everything, right, that I think, I think globally we are understanding that the, um, you know, being, being s centered in this understanding of, well, the, the, the correct way is, is Western, is European, is, um, you know, that there's something, that that has to be a center versus, well, that's one reference point to you know to any other culture of, of reference point for what their um, for what their uh, ideal perhaps of what singing is is going to be is, is going to be totally different and that that is no it's not it doesn't need to be exoticized or oh isn't it funny how you know the pygmies use this yodeling technique and that's what you know what it doesn't need to be said in this um, in this kind of quaint, exoticizing way, it really is that that we can see um, these different centers for for people's understanding of what's natural. Say um, that I think because I was told that I was singing wrong so much of the time, um, or felt like it was wrong, that um, I sought out different different centers you know well what's what does this culture think is correct correct singing or beautiful um and and it's endlessly fascinating I mean I would love to just travel the world and and be studying vocal techniques from around the world because I mean um because it's so essential I mean it it says you could get, I would love to get a doctorate degree in that, I mean, just what it says about culture and, and um, you know, one sense of, of humanness to to figure out how, how people sing and what the texture of their voice, um, how that comes about, what, what it represents. It's just, it's really interesting. So at the moment, you know, you're learning this Italian classical technique, but you've brought some other vocal techniques to a vocal group that you've been working with, haven't you? Room Full of Teeth. Yeah, yeah, Room Full of Teeth. Actually, they that's what they do, is that they study techniques from around the world. It's They're really incredible. And so they, they're, they are, you know, Western classical singers, but then I think the first, one of the first things that they studied was, was yodeling technique. Uh, and also throat throat singing. I think it's Tuvan throat singing that they studied. Um, so they, um, which is really unusual to get classical singers to use their voices in that way, because I think you know they there is this sense of oh, oh that's wrong, that's going to hurt your voice, versus learning how to do these things really correctly so that um, so that it does it doesn't need to injure your voice. Um, and I think one of the examples we were talking about is Korean pun. Pansori, I think it's pronounced, I don't know. But that was the technique that they were learning when I started working with them. Um, and the idea is that the composer comes in, I being the composer, ha, I didn't, <laughs> that was probably the first time that I called myself a composer and I was using finale to try to like, you know, enter in the notes and figure out if I was notating it right and stuff. But, um, but I came in and they were studying Pansori and Pansori is, you know, what the, at least what I heard first about it was like, yeah, it's this technique where the masters of it study and, and they, they make this sound until their voice literally bleeds, you know, they're like bleeding out of their vocal cords. And I was like, what, you know, and, um, and that's, uh, that's like, was kind of felt like the mythology around that style of singing. But, um, so how do you make your vocal cords bleed? Well, I mean, it's all t just tissue and right. I don't know. I've never done it before. Thank God, but um, but that it's that that it's the. Um, I think the the spiritual idea around it was like I think this is what I remember probably incorrectly, but shouting into a waterfall. I think it was that something so loud that you you and can you imagine the physical experience of making so much noise for so long that. Um, that the tissue, you know, that that there's blood. I'm oh, sorry, this is it's kind this of a dark, dark subject matter. <laughs> and I know nothing. I know so little about this type style of music. So you, understand. You that. sent me a clip of um, a kind of master of this, this uh, singing technique. 
And that, that doesn't square with what I saw from this singer who was mm -hmm. this incredibly composed singer using her voice in this. I mean, we should see, there's a, we've got a little clip of it. We should have a look at it. And then you can tell us a bit more about the composition you made afterwards. Can we have the uh, Sang Ah uh, Lee clip, please? That's the, the kind of last minute or so of a, a 10 minute performance. What do you get from her, what she's doing with her voice? Uh, I mean, I realize how ignorant I am about that style of music. I mean, I, I what I'm remembering also now is that the relationship between the drum and the singer, um, that that's probably a, such a, an enormous part of, of that. But, um, but, you know, just that if, you know, if you see a, an Italian opera singer come, and you you imagine a certain style of singing that um, that people revere as beautiful singing, and that um, that I hear in that much more, you know, uh, guttural or or belt or chest or whatever you want to call that. Um, it's it's a the the it sounds different and it and it feels different. Um, and that, you know, when when different cultures go to see beautiful, I mean, just as we in, in our whatever, all of our cultures that are represented here, what do we expect to hear from singers and what is what is considered beautiful? What I consider beautiful is often considered very ugly to some people. And um, and it's been interesting singing and, you know, through the years and hearing people say, you know, she sounds like, oh, I thought it was a man or, um, you know, what, what people identify with what beautiful singing is or what, what a woman's voice is supposed to sound like, or, um, yeah, what, what we attach to, to voice. Can we just go back to this composition a tiny minute? So you were given kind of almost ingredients, source material, and then you created a piece for them based on the styles of these? Yeah. That they had, Style? they said, you know, so what we've covered so far is yodeling, throat singing, pansori, uh, I'm forgetting now, oh, and, and broad, kind of Broadway belting, uh, which is interesting to, to really get a, you know, a lesson about, you know, from, from classical voice students on how to healthily do, do a belt style. So, so they asked me to use those techniques in a composition for them. Okay, should we quick listen to it? Sure. I want to ask you about beats. Yeah, and I how, was sorry. just gonna say, can we talk about rhythm? <laughs> <laughs> We're there. Um, rhythms, beats. How do you develop them, and how how do you uh, how do beats come to you? How do you develop them, and can you give us an example of how it works for you? Sure. And I also want to say that listening listening to that piece, there's. Um, because it made me think about rhythm, because I think that people working with classical singers and rhythm is really interesting because there's like when people are used to classical conducting, it's very different to me than, than the way that I understand rhythm, which is kind of he like hearing this really strong groove because groove isn't primary in a lot of that music. So, so hearing that composition is really interesting to remember how I heard it in my head and then how it was interpreted by classical singers is, is actually really different. What's, um, what's the gap? What were the differences? Well, um, and again, not, not to say that it was, that anything's wrong. It's just so, it's that, um, uh, how do I describe it? It's just a precision with rhythm. I guess, you know, I would assume that most of us in this room are, um, are I don't know who you are, but, but that we're fluent in um, in beat making. I mean that that's that that is something that um, that is you know when you're working in computers and synthesizers and drum machines um, and growing up in the '80s and '90s. That's you know I am used to this. There's a machine making a beat for me, and um, that's not. That's not the focus in Western classical music. There's there's a lot of other focuses, and especially for singers, there's a kind of fluidity of rhythm um, 
the composer is going like this and the downbeat isn't like dun, 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 dun. It's like somewhat, I don't know where it is. <laughs> I couldn't follow it if I was being conducted that way um, versus being used to the click track in the studio or being used to, you know, singing to a, to a drum beat. Um, so my, so that has always been super fascinating to me is the perception of rhythm and the traditions of rhythm that are, as I was talking about before, like the more laid back, which is what I tend to be more attracted to than playing on top of the beat where you're almost, you know, you're, you're playing on or almost ahead of the metronome. Um, so to answer the question about how I, I mean, beats are everywhere. And so I tend to pick them up in ways how, like a garage door coming down. I was walking down the street near our studio and there was just like, it was like, or whatever. And I, and just hearing it that way. So a lot of it is from, from walking and having the a pace of walking, um, interact with some other kind of rhythm, rhythmic elements. And then I've been taking um, Haitian drum lessons. And so that there's a, a, a lot of those um, kind of essential beats underneath those Haitian rhythms that are now really internalized. So especially the, like if the downbeats here, that kind of like six eight, but never he, never emphasizing the downbeat. The downbeat is implied. So um, so now that has been that has been coming out a lot in in what I do. But um, I just got an MPC for the first time, and uh, and I can't believe that I've never used an MPC before. And that um, I don't know. I think that rhythm. There are lots of rhythms that I just want to hear that are you know, stored from our memories, right? <laughs> um, memories and, uh, yeah, I think rhythm is pretty much everywhere. So I just listen for it. So what's your relationship with your drum teacher, uh, Daniel Breville? Cause he's the guy that got you involved in kind of Haitian drumming, right? Yeah. Well, um, I, you know, live in the Bay area. And so I, I knew a lot of people who had come out of Mills college, um, Sam Ospivat is a drummer that came out of Mills and he was taking um, lessons with Danielle. Um, Danielle had, had also taught Chess Smith, another drummer. Um, and there was this, uh, you know, I got, I was just part of, I feel part of a lineage of uh, drummers who have, um, who have taken lessons with Danielle and, um, and continue to and study with him. Um, he, uh, I mean, as, as with any teacher, you know, that, that you find your teacher and then you realize how much, you know, I will never learn in my lifetime all that there is to be learned about that drumming. Um, but uh, I've learned a lot about how music affects me spiritually and how it needs to affect me spiritually in order to um, continue doing it. And that um, because the Haitian drumming is part of voodoo ritual um, and an, at least a very, to me, a, a pretty basic understanding and elementary understanding of the association with um, rhythms to the spirits that they represent and are, are associated with. Um, that has been, that's been a pretty um, incredible experience to have. And also just the fact that he's a master drummer and has been playing since he was a kid and to see someone to, to study with a master, that's what it, that's what I'm doing. And very infrequently and very, you know, I have to say, okay, I'm putting my lessons on pause to go tour for two years. Sorry, can I come back and try to, you know, it's very, uh, it feels very inconsistent and, um, I do the best I can and he, we laugh. <laughs> I laugh at myself um, about how little how little I really know, but um, but it's been you know it's been a an incredible education in rhythm because you know when we learn from from a master but also from a tradition that we're unfamiliar with it suddenly opens up all these different neural pathways. And what did you learn through that through the relationship between drums and the dancer? Uh, it's just really, it's been really cool. I, I dance, I dance in a Haitian class usually on Sundays. Um, and, and then drum for the same class. And, and that was a real education for me about, um, 
that you really need one to know the other, re- truly. Um, I guess the same way that, you know, if you're a DJ, that you really, you need to know what, what is, you know, what a room wants or like what, you know, listening to a room and listening to the rhythm of, a, of an evening, listening to what people's bodies are wanting to do, listening to, um, to what works and what doesn't work. Um, but in Haitian Vodou, there's this, I mean, uh, intricately connected the dancer and the drummer and, you know, just as an example, there's a thing called a casse, um, a break in the rhythm where, um, where the dancer, you know, the, the beat goes haywire for a second and all of a sudden it like rips open this, this to me, it's like ripping open this huge possibility in rhythm and, and the, the dancer, the drummer has to read the dancer, the dancer has to read the drummer, whatever is going on. And I, again, know so little about how that gets communicated, but, um, but, uh, you know, it's all, all the, all the dances have different variations that the drums either guide or are guided by the, the dancers. Um, everything is a relationship between the dancer and the drummer. So, so closely related. And, um, and it, they just can't be divorced. I I have learned rhythms. I usually learn the rhythm um, a half a half measure off because when Daniel plays a rhythm, he starts it. I think he usually starts it on like the three beat. Uh, so I hear it as the one, and so I'll learn a beat backwards basically, and then have to translate it in my mind to know where the pulse is. But if I've done the dance, um, I know where the pulse is because I know how it's been. How I've how I've needed to dance to it. So, how do you think this relationship between kind of drums, music, and dancing translates into your music and the the kind of need to see what's happening, how people are responding to it, and to feed that back into the music? Um, you know, I I've been wanting to to do it the maybe the old way of doing it, which is to put music in front of people before it's put on record and, and given to people because that's the only way. If you put it in front of people and you see how they how their bodies respond to it or how they, re, you know, in general respond to it. Um, and then in, in, in a kind of improvisatory way, which is possible with looping pedals, um, listen to what the room is wanting and then go, go do that. Um, that... That didn't happen, I think, on the on our last record because it was made. Um, it was kind of made cerebrally, <laughs> honestly. So it was made before it got put in front of people, and that was that was kind of difficult. And I think all the other Tune Yards music before that, I've generally been generally been able to put it in front of people, uh, see how people respond, and then use that to inform the recordings. So. Um, so I don't know. I think I struggle with that. And I think, you know, for, for those of us who spend a lot of time again in front of computers or, or creating music, like unless, unless you're doing something where you're, I mean, that's why DJing I think is so great because you're actively being, you know, you're, you, you're in the hot seat when you're a DJ, you, you need to, to make the room move, you know, that's your job or you disappoint and, um, and to have that kind of instantaneous response, uh, is, is really useful, perhaps, perhaps mandatory. So if you think about music like footwork that's developed in conjunction with dancers and, and with dancers in mind, can you maybe imagine yourself testing out some of the new music down the dance studio? Hmm. Sure. <laughs> Thanks for the idea. <laughs> um, one quick thing I wanted to ask you was about the kind of practicalities of singing and drumming and maybe also playing keyboards at the same time, something that you, you do live and I guess when you're making music as well sometimes. Mm. Does your voice have to become another limb? Does it have to become autonomic in the way that limbs do when you're drumming? What happens? Um, I'm trying to think of, like, I think it's, again, getting out of the way of the voice and I think um, it actually really helps me. I think something that I don't appreciate about music performance is I don't appreciate when people seem to be emotionally involved in the music, um, or at least I don't, this is hard to describe. It's not that I'm not emotionally connected, but it's very practical when I'm performing because of that, because usually I have a floor tom here, a snare here, 
and I'm singing and I have looping pedals. So every limb of my body is involved and, and I have to be getting out of the way of my voice and relaxing my voice and thinking about, about breathing and, and that's where my focus is. And then letting the music kind of emote for itself, that trusting that the emotion was there in the composition of the music that I don't need to give it an, I don't need to go, uh, I'm a real thing, you know, like even that, it's like, it feels like everything's just super tight. Uh, but I think that's what we're used to in a lot of performance is, is seeing people get, you know, be into it or whatever. And, um, and I find that that, um, it was so again, interesting to hear Pauline talk about that, but then if you're so invested in this, in your own story of yourself and what the music means and everything, you're, you can't be listening because you're, it's like you're living in a different time zone. You're living in the past of when you created it versus what's happening now. And I think that's, um, yeah, that was a long way to answer that question. wasn't answering the question at all. Again. Well, fortunately, it did answer the question, but also we have like a little master drummer type person who has some thoughts on this. So can we have the Von Helm clip, please? Wow, that was super informative. I, I definitely, that's true that I, I do memorize which words are supposed to hit. You know, I, I know I know certain, yeah, you got to match them up. So you concur? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Levon. <laughs> so a couple more things from me before we kind of pass it out to you guys. I just wanted to ask you about your kind of favorite drums um, and also your favorite drum machines, the kind of things you're working with at the moment. Uh, favorite drums, you mean like companies? Well, no more like, I don't know, like particular instruments that you have that you've always carried with you or yeah. new drums you've got or, you know. Yeah, I drum. always love a super dead floor tom. It's kind of key. And um, and that's mostly because with looping, looping live drums, the drums really need to be not so resonant so that uh, you don't get feedback and you don't get rings, you know, tones ringing that you don't want mm -hmm. there. Um, but... Um, lately we've been using the Tempest a lot, the Tempest drum machine, Dave Smith. Um, uh, and that is because it's an analog drum machine and has sounds that you can really get in and mess with, um, oscillators and filtering and, um, and be very, um, be very specific about the sounds. And, uh, we just got a TR8 so that we have a, um, a super standard 808 and 909 sound, which I, um, that was something I learned from working with other producers is just, um, you kind of need an 808 or, or 909 uh, kick sound a lot of the time. At least I'm finding that I do in order to um, emulate some, maybe emulates the wrong word, in order to get power from a kick drum, it's really useful to have those at least in the mix. So um, so we got that as kind of, you know, uh, a, a very easily programmable drum machine. Drum machines are pretty new f for me. Um, but uh, yeah, that's what we've been working with lately. And kind of iPad apps? Yep. Yeah, I'd use funk box a lot of the time. <laughs> Anyone use that? Yeah. It's really fun. Uh, yeah, Funkbox was like one of the first apps where I just, I got into, um, you know, on the road, on the touring road, just being able to, to make beats that way. And, um, and uh, I've had GarageBand like that. I mean, I was super ashamed to be like, really? Like, this is what I'm using to, to write music. And I don't know why I was ashamed. I think it's way more, um, you get indie cred from like, you know, writing on a like tape recorder from 1982 in you know battery powered in your knapsack and uh, whatever, um, but but it was the iPad and and being able to like on a plane have my my like headpiece for my phone and be like recording onto GarageBand on an airplane some vocal idea that I had and then getting the like. <laughs> like screaming baby in the background and having all of that just be part of the uh, composition is really wild. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think 
all of these things, you know, especially the things that if I'm going to spend money on an iPad, I'm going to use the, you know, free or $7.99, whatever application to, to do what I can with it. It's, it is, as we all know, really incredible what we can do with our phones and, and things. Mm-hmm. Are there any kind of nostalgic instruments or pieces of kit you have that you've, you've brought with you all the way through? Sure. Yeah. I, well, the first album, uh, Tunior's album Bird Brains was made on this little voice recorder, handheld voice recorder. So I have that still. And um I think it's I think it's a little messed up over the years. Um it only it has a kind of like really super crazy shrill high end now that I don't think it used to. Maybe it did used to, and maybe I've just become more uh, perceptive. But um, but yeah, I I think the the sense of like super compressed sound in any way coming in super compressed, um, and definitely these quote unquote lo-fi um, machines or elements where you get um, you get like for instance in listening to Pauline's um, tape work there's that ever present hiss of tape that I, I just am really attached to, to those, you know, the kind of ambient, the deeper listening sounds, the other layers that are there. Um, and I'm finding that with the MPC too, that it has this natural color to it that, um, that you can sample something and then being processed through the MPC and, and out through whatever outboard gear we were using, um, it just it has this it has its the the sounds have their own world and that is far more interesting to me i think in this day and age too that it's um to find original sounds to find sounds that are actually like what oh, i don't think i've heard that before you really need to um layer or process organic matter i think organic um source material so i'm hearing a lot of producers talk about that especially with voice you know, processing voice and creating, um, you know, in the studio, I produced this album for Tao and the Get Down, Stay Down. And and in that, I was working with Bo Sorensen, uh, a really amazing engineer. And, and we were talking about, like, how many layers do you need to create, like, an innovative hand clap sound, you know? <laughs> and at this point, it's maybe, how, like, how many 10. Mm, I think 10, probably. Well, not 10. We probably used six or something. But, you know, how many how many layers do you need to stack before you're like, oh, my God, that's the best hand clap I've ever heard, man, you know? Um, because at this point, it's fine. Like, a lot of these sounds are nostalgic. Like, the, the, the 808 and 9, 909 sounds are like, oh, yeah, I know what that, I just, yep there it is. Or you associate these drum machines with very specific hip hop albums or very, you know, you, you know where these things come from. So, um, so source material is all around us. And, and I think, um, I don't use Ableton. I would love to learn it. And I feel like I'm one of the few people who don't use Ableton, but, um, but there's this ability now to just go like, okay, bam, 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 bam. I've got this stack of things that, um, that together, if I know what frequencies are not going to cancel each other out, if I know how to how to make the layer cake just right, uh, it can really add up to this w- amazing new palette. It's all about the palettes. Mm-hmm. So, do we have the microphones ready for some questions? Yeah. Okay. So we have a question here at the front to start with, and then we will move around. Thank you so much. Thank you. Big fan. Um, two questions, if I may. One's a little bit more technical. In looping live drums, which I feel pretty uh, uh, attached to, I feel it's very important to keep the live drum there, if anything, just for the energy of it and the quality of the sound. But it's inevitably a challenge to, once you hit the drum and once it goes into the looping pedal, it changes. Mm-hmm. And uh, as you're playing bigger audiences and, and want to be playing festivals and, and things of that nature without giving up the live drum, how do you doctor the loops drum so that once you solve all the problems of feedback to make it equal to the initial live strike and to let it be the big thing it needs to be subharmonic synthesizer so what what's that mean <laughs> thank you for that question it's that i mean looping and the tech the tech i mean i say that as if there's one answer there's not one answer and and i have i was joking with a woman musician of mine about how many times i've been told by engineers who are like hey uh why don't you do it this way and and like yep. how how many times i'm like gosh really <laughs> uh and it's because a lot of it just needs sorting out. A lot of it's the room too. But what we, um, Eli Cruz, 
when the engineer that worked with us on Who Kill on the last album too, he um, was our front of house engineer and he was like, you know, what if we uh, use the PV Cosmos subharmonic synthesizer so that, um, it re- you know, I release a gate when I hit the floor tom and uh, it triggers the, the that synth so that you're getting, <clears throat> you're getting the impact. Um, so that was, that was one way. I think... Um, I think it was, I mean, there's a lot of trial, you know, and I think looping pedals are getting better and, you know, all of our, the capacity of machines to handle and understand sound and what we want from sound is getting much better, but I'm always, I'm always seeking and learning. I totally agree that, you know, the, the strike is so important and the energy of that is so important. Um, and and for me, I mean, really at this point, because we're playing venues that are sometimes cavernous, not, you know, we're not playing, whatever, we're not playing for millions of people, but like we opened for Arcade Fire and that was in arenas. And how do you get this pretty crappy floor tom that has been deadened? You know, I have a sock taped on the bottom. It's like completely tuned down. There's not, there's hardly any resonance on that drum. And that's because, um, I need just as much, just enough tension so that I'm not hurting myself and that I'm getting enough play from the drum. But, um, but it really needs to, it, it needs to go through a subharmonic synth at that point to get that, the punch to it. Um, the, the, snare part is, you know, for me uh, about tuning and making sure again, that you're not getting the ring that's going to cause you trouble after a number of loops. But, um, but yeah, the floor Tom, that was, thank God for Eli and that solution. Cause that was really tough. And then if I could do another one, um, working with the looping pedal, you, I feel like you sort of lock yourself in a room and like a labyrinth and it's become, you know, my personal, rebellious, solitary system of writing and making music. So being here has been quite challenging because I really don't know how to communicate with, with this like little Wizard of Oz thing that I've built for myself. So any advice that you have on working with these people here? I mean, or anybody. Yeah. <laughs> how to play here. nice with others. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, for sure, understood. It's hard. And I think, I mean, it meant so much to me to be... It meant so much to me because I had an inferiority complex for a long time about what I could, was capable of as a musician. It meant a lot for me to be like, look at me, I'm a one woman band, look what I can do all by myself, you know? And that, it, I think that's valid and it was tough for me to give that up. I'm, and I don't think I have given that up, but um, but um, I would say patience was a huge thing, but also what you said, communicating, that um, I think we... We often, because, you know, what do you talk about when you talk about music? That, like, well, how do we talk about music? How do we talk about sound? And how do we, without without um, without always getting lost in terminology and, and kind of, like, processing, and this is what I meant, this is what I meant. How do you do that? I, I think they're just finding, finding terms and finding, um, being flexible and, and also being, being settled enough in what you know about yourself as a musician. You know, this is, this is what I know I can bring, but this is also what I know I can't bring. This is what I, I don't know. I mean, also, um, finding out what you're curious about and what you don't, what you don't know is a great doorway to open, you know, okay, what I'm like, what I'm looking for is someone who really knows Ableton so that I can sample this drum and blah, 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 you know, like whatever it is, uh, if I if I let myself agree to just with myself that I don't know everything, <laughs> like that there's stuff that I don't know, I think that's a really powerful phrase. I don't know, you know, I don't know. Teach me. I don't know. Share with me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm the idiot that keeps coughing. Down to you too. I'm really sorry. Um, yeah, uh, you mentioned at the beginning of the uh, the lecture about. Um, Establishing your own practice and centering yourself as to not kind of be swayed by the other voices, by other people's opinions of you. And I was kind of wondering, uh, like, how did, how, how, yeah. Exactly. (laughs) I don't know. Uh, uh, It's hard. I mean, really hard. And I think especially when, you know, in that, I guess what I've learned is, um, what I'm learning is to be, be protective of, of my creative space, 
which means creative space and time. So one thing I've been doing, first of all, I've been meditating in the morning. That really does, it really changes things because it is this time to to turn it off, you know, as as best I can practice. Um, it It's really helped me to have a practice as in, I now have a vocal practice. I have warm-ups that I do. I have drum rudiments that I do. Um, and those those things that I guess bring me, they keep me on this humble level of what I know and what I don't know. And kind of just starting there. Like I don't need, I don't need to be a hero today. <laughs> I don't need to do anything actually. All I need to do is show up for the practice. Um, the other thing is technology, which is really hard when you're working with, you're working on a computer and your email is right there and the internet is right there and all your critics are right there, you know, and it's the same interface. You're watching the same screen. So I have started to set up absolute boundaries. Like I, the best day is when I don't, I, I have my phone's on airplane mode until 4 p.m. I wake up, I do my thing, I walk to my studio again feel like this is a privileged, privileged life that I'm leading, that this is what I get to do. But I walk to my studio, I do my practices and I, so I'm centered in all these things. And then, um, I lie down on the floor and cry <laughs> because what that next step is of, um, going from all the things that feel like are in my general control to the abyss of the unknown of what's going to happen in the studio today is terrifying. And, um, but, but I give myself time and space for that. And, and I don't, the, I really don't know. Those are all the things I do now, but, um, I just, I think that we have it for me, I have enough of this self-sabotaging voice that's not good enough. That sounds like so-and-so. You're just copying that from blah, blah, blah. Someone's going to say you just appropriated three countries worth of African music. You know what I mean? Like that stuff is in my head all the time. So, um, so, oh, and writing. I've been writing a lot in the morning. So all those things to kind of filter that stuff out and then, and then kind of worship the creative process. I mean, like literally put put my offerings out on the table, say my prayers to the creative gods who are going to help me today. I mean, like getting spiritual about the shit because um, <clears throat> performing, especially I've been blessed to perform in front of so many people and that can really get to you super fast that all of a sudden you're in front of people. I mean, right now, why am I up here talking? What do I have to say? What are you getting from this? Why would you sit here for so freaking long listening to me talk? You know, those are the things that I need to put down in order to just be of service to whatever this is. I have, lastly, there's this book called The Artist's Way, which I had been, mm -hmm, I've been told about for years. And I was always like, well, that's for other people who need to know about how to be an artist. I am an artist. <laughs> Oh, and I have been humbled by many a thing, um, including, you know, all these, like the numbing devices, including using, you know, there's a lot of, of addictive tendency that I've uncovered in my life that I've needed to deal with. It's, I would much rather do anything else than be with myself in a room creating. I would much rather be, you know, any number of things. I'd much rather be tuning out instead of tuning in. And, um, and that book, The Artist's Way, has been really helpful lately in terms of, of, you know, equalizing us. That we're all, we're all. This is it's really special that we get to do this. It's really special that we get to be involved in creative process and involved so much in honoring creative process as something that's valuable, not something that's like for the freaks who don't have to get real jobs, but that is part of being a human and part of, a, you know, our music is my way of understanding what it is to be on this planet. And without that sounding too grandiose or whatever, that's, that's what I attach to it. That's how I feel about it. I hope that was helpful. Yes, I get... <laughs> hey, uh, thank Hi. you for being here. Thank you. Um, I have one comment and a uh, question. Um, you were speaking earlier about uh, listening to female voices and I just I think it's a really refreshing start to get two uh, female uh, lectures today opposed to last week. Mm. Um, sec second of all, um, I was just interested in you elaborating on 
um, how you approach melodies and and harmonies how much how much you like think about the chords and, and stuff like that and how you think of them yeah thanks for that and um i i think melody comes pretty naturally being a singer i mean that that feels like a blessing just to have again a vocal practice where i might be practicing practicing scales and feeling where different notes sound uh you know resonate in my body and that is a great source for for melody a kind of endless source for melody and i would i don't know how many of you consider yourself singers but i always i always hope that musicians who don't consider themselves singers are singing anyway because i think that it is it's it is you know it's our first instrument i guess yes um m- chords and theory and harmonization uh are I because I'm because I never studied music formally. I um, it, that is a by ear thing for me. That what I want to hear, but also Nate Brenner, who I work with in Tune Yards, my husband is um, is a bass player and is trained in jazz theory, and so he will offer this great counterpoint. I will do a song and it just is a pretty much a drone in G or something. And he'll be like, well, what if the bass line does this? And it's basically reharmonizing everything that I'm doing. And that has been one of those gifts of collaboration where I, I stuck really close to like, oh, I don't want, you're changing my whole piece. You know, my piece is this drone and you're changing it. But, it, um, but it's brought out so many different I, I mean, I think I would probably I would be bored with with myself. You know, I would be bored with my with my drone or my like general tendency to to like do a one four five progression or just one four one four one four one four. I could probably be happy with that for a long time, but um, but to learn to learn the the yeah the universe of possibilities with with chords and then to hear I mean to do these deep listening exercises and hear. Um, you know, to hear what tuning to each other's voices as a group brings. I mean, I mean that that harmony is you know bringing out all these microtones, and there's just so much possible, possible, and so much that doesn't need to be confined to keyboards and to you know instruments that are in tune. And I think, um, yeah, I think I feel very lucky that the voice was my entryway into music because because of all the in between tones that it allows for. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very thank much. You. Hi. Hi. Um, I can relate to so many things that you said. Thank you. Okay. Um, not only the morning pages. <laughs> and, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, I was wondering, can you work with your uh, kind of old way of singing wrong, you know, and uh, and both like the the new things that you learn now with the classical training because my background is that I had a lot of singing education but I think I I was always lucky enough to ignore my teachers enough so I could just keep my natural voice because it was always very important uh, so I was wondering if you can combine maybe the two of them because I think both of them those like sure. yeah can have a lot of valuable things absolutely yeah and and I know I mean I say wrong because that's what that was a yeah that was a that was word that was used with me but I would never use that I don't think that there is a, a way that's wrong I think there's a way that's more sustainable than not but um, but yeah my my teacher uh, has def- Deborah Benedict is her name and she's um, she's so great at at assuring me that I don't need to lose any that I'm gaining voice I'm not losing a voice and real thing I was already using different you know, that was the part I used to go, or whatever, even that's not wrong. See, I can't sing wrong. It's just different. Um, And there, um, but there's these different, yeah, that, that, um, that I gain possibility with my voice and I gain flexibility and that, um, that's, that is exciting versus limiting. So good for you, ignoring what needed to be ignored. (laughs) May I ask, do you know, uh, um, what is it called? Les Voix Bulgaires, uh, Le Mist. Mm. They're amazing, aren't they? Um, yeah. And yeah. I was always like, I kept, I will never be able to sing like that because it's not, because I thought I would definitely hurt myself because I don't know the technique. I think it's a very specific technique, but it's mm-hmm. not 
taught by a school, but by culture, I, I guess, or from people who sang it before. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, I was just I just wanted to mention that. And can I ask another thing? Sorry, just yeah. one more thing. Um, have you heard of uh, this kind of uh, screaming school in LA? I I heard about mm -mm. somebody who would teach screaming, but because I I can sing loud, I guess, and I can scream in a nice way beautiful way a female voice beautiful thingy blah blah but <laughs> i would like to have some more dirt in in my screaming but i cannot do it without hurting myself mm -hmm. have you heard of something like that before? no is it like for metal singing like that kind uh, of screaming you mean like grinding and and the burr thing yeah uh no i think it's more like steven tyler kind of screaming ah <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly. yeah um no i haven't heard of it okay. but but i i mean i think that I, and I'm not sure, but I think there's there, I mean, for sure you can, first of all, there's got to be teachers who are singing Bulgarian and Eastern European singing. My, I say that because I know that there have been, I've had, you know, instruction in that somehow of, of where that resonance comes from. But I, I also think um, a study of any, I mean, if, you know, I can afford lessons, I couldn't always afford lessons, but even just taking, a, you know, I, I remember I did a puppet, puppet opera and that was my first opera lesson. And I just, I, you know, I'm sure I paid the woman very little money, but she gave me this, just another perspective on the voice. And I think, um, I don't know, I've become a real proponent of taking lessons, even if, you know, I'm supposed to be an expert now, but I always want to be training and taking, because we're always, because we always are learning. Otherwise, what's the point? boring um but yeah thanks i'll look up the scream school <laughs> <laughs> thank you hi um thanks. i wonder if maybe you could share something you were talking about your warm-up and you also said that uh you kind of fight a bit of tension and stuff like that do you have any uh like exercises that you do for your warm-up that helps you not to get into that kind of tense um you know headspace with singing mm. I usually start with, uh, down the scale and then up the scale. <laughs> um, and, um, and then I do, I have a tape worth of about 30 minutes of, of these vocal warm ups that I do. Um, and I also find it, um, I took a workshop a long time ago by the Roy Hart uh, theater group and I, because I came from a theater background, so I was studying theater voice for theater mostly in the beginning. And, um, and I find that a lot of those, um, there's an exercise, which I will not demonstrate now, but basically you're lying on your back and you are, your knees are up, your feet are on the ground, but you're kind of, it's called spinal rocking. And I find that, um, that, just anything to to let my body find the natural gravity of things and the weight of things um, be grounded. That is a is a really imperative place to start. Um, so anytime you know any anything, I guess in in any kind of meditative practice or or instrument practice, there's a sense of how you know how much. It's not how much do I have to how many muscles do I have to use? It's how few muscles do I have to use? What can I let go of? How much can I possibly relax? Um, so yeah, I do a lot of, um, I'm trying to think of the warm ups I do on the road. I do a lot of like humming and, um, getting into this, um, into a nasality part of my voice, because I think that's where I found, you know, I found that I need to, um, to direct a lot of the power of my voices through there. So it's definitely making a fool of myself. I'm, if, if we're on tour in a city, you can find me walking down any sidewalk going, you know, <laughs> a willingness Thanks. to look like a fool. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi. Hi. Yeah, big fan also. Um, um, I'd like to ask you a little, to talk a little bit more about how feminism has intersected with your work. Because, I mean, we've kind of, said a little bit about it um, and like I also have like an observation about about this and how um, playing by yourself like being a woman playing on your own like how did you get to that conclusion was it because of of some things that have happened or 
did you just realize it afterwards? Like, was it a natural process? Like, how how does the fact that being a woman in in the music and and all that stuff we have to deal with um, has it influenced you in getting to the conclusion you, that you needed to play on your own? And yeah, just that kind of stuff. Um, thanks for that question. I I mean, I think playing on my own was 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 really important just as from an artist's perspective to know what I was, where kind of what, what, what I was bringing to the table, because I'm always, I've always been playing with people, but they're, you know, Tune Yard started as what, as me defining what I wanted to hear. And I guess that for me was, um, was, you know, from my I am a woman and I grew up I grew up as a woman and I think I internalized a lot of things as a woman that I wanted to um I wanted to test out well like you know what do I know how to do or what am I capable of I I do think that um I think feminism is first of all so wonderfully open to men and women and that um to believe in equality of the sexes and to believe in, yeah, the equality of humans um, is, is feminism. And, and it's been really important for me to, to have two yards as, as my own, as something that's my own. Um, sorry that but it's so huge. How do I talk about it? But, um, but I would say that these things such as, you know, being told by specifically, because when you're on, on tour, you know, I'm wearing this t-shirt that says Wham! Women's Audio Mission, which is in San Francisco. And Women's Audio Mission is uh, a place where, um, where only women are allowed to, to touch the equipment. They lose their funding if a man touches the soundboard. <laughs> for real uh and and there you know what there I'm forgetting what the percentage is but it's like it's like a terribly small I wish I knew the figure percentage of women who are who are out there in the tech technical fields of music and we have this wonderful opportunity now where we all you know so many of us have this have our laptops and have access to being able to experiment with um with with the technical side of making music, and uh, for me, for a long time, that was a really big obstacle of just like I didn't think I didn't think I could do that. I had to go to a studio um, and pr work with probably a male engineer, um, who, as we know, ever, anyone involved in the sound making is having some kind of influence on the sound, and so. Um, Tune Yards was this first way, and the only way I knew how was for okay, this voice recorder it it records sound, and then I can you know like mini input eighth inch input from there into my computer real time, record it real time, and then multi track that way. So that was just that was um, that was my way of having my hands on on every single aspect of it, and and yes, it was it was empowering, you know, um, and. Um, and I appreciate that I think all of these things with the advent of, of technology and, and with, you know, such a clear um, accessibility that, that everybody has now to, to these tools for making, in, to making music, um, that I think this is all, it's just going through massive change as is our whole world. Um, does that answer your question? It's a big one. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Yes Thank and you. no. <laughs> we can okay. talk more. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Let's. Do we have any more? Or is it now just time? Oh, we have one more. I wonder if it's okay. Of course it's okay. Of course it's okay. Just kind of actually to add on to what you're talking about. Because um, as a woman, I also I feel like I just want to be a person. And I don't really want to be viewed that way, especially like when you're working in a male dominated industry. And uh, I kind of realized I was a woman <laughs> in my 20s. <laughs> but before that, I was just like, I'm a musician. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm really happy with how in the industry women are becoming more um, 
magnified or, or, or being made aware of. But sometimes I, I was having a conversation with another woman about this when there's all this um, focus on women specifically, it almost can feel there's like writing a line sometimes of is this kitschy or something where it's like, do we really have to take it to this level for people to understand? And is the goal in the end to just magnify it and make it almost extreme in um, its awareness so we can balance it back out so it's a social norm? And like, is that the goal? Or is that how you feel? It's really confusing, right? I mean, I'm I'm constantly confused by it. And we were talking before, you know, I have this radio show that is specifically highlighting women producers because I feel it's missing, you know, and but it's not to be ex like, you know, I don't, I think this is also that we can make sure that we are heard. Everybody can be heard. And we were talking like, you know, I think Steve Reich and Terry Riley's names, I knew about their names before I heard of Pauline Oliveros. And that was like, why? Be, you know, why is that? And, and that is, um, it's trouble. It was troubling to me how, cause I, I want to just, I just want to be like, can we just, um, can I not be, can I not be a woman musician? Can I be a musician? But there is, but there is a gap and there is a, um, there is there is room to fill, and I think like technology, it's going to go. You know, I hope that all of these um, these things that that um, that I don't know that these things that that become um, like you know women being un so underrepresented in the industry that that is just like in a few years, just like and now we don't talk about that anymore. Now we're you know, but uh, I just I. I do think that we live in a patriarchal society in general and that we have this opportunity to, um, to again, to be, um, to be hearing everybody. I do think there's a danger of an exoticism of, of, you know, amplifying voices. Amplifying voices is different than exoticizing voices. And, um, and I also, you know, I feel like I'm a woman, but I often don't, I don't feel very feminine. I don't, you know, I have had, um, I've thought a lot in my life about my sexuality and how my sexuality um, defines who I am and being very afraid of sexuality in general and being, um, you know, there, there are all of these there are all these nuances that don't get talked about when we just talk about categories, you know, and how instead of listening to each other's stories and listening in this very intimate way, how does it feel? I mean, how does it feel to be a man who feels a great amount of femininity? How does it, you know, there's, there's just this whole, especially in the, in the, you know, kind of social media centric world where everything is like, a bite instead of these very um, fluid definitions of things um, and fluid definitions of ourselves. So, um, so yeah, I just want to listen more. I think that's such a great way to start the day by by you know hearing a lecture on deep listening because that that is it's listening in in like so many different ways with so many parts of ourselves. Thanks. Well, I think we can all agree we've really enjoyed listening to you. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks so much.